Moving along, our first speaker today is Dr. Mark Harrison. He's a health economist, epidemiologist. I kind of wondered what an epidemiologist was, so I went to Dr. Google, and epidemiologists are scientists who study diseases within populations of people. They analyze what causes disease outbreaks in order to treat existing diseases and prevent future outbreaks. Dr. Harrison is interested in quality of life issues, risks in healthcare decision making, health technology, and healthcare interventions. Today, he will be speaking about arthritis prevention. Okay, good morning, and uh, thank you, John, for the introduction. I think Pompous Ass would have covered it nicely, but thanks for the, uh, the clarification afterwards. So, today I'm starting right at the beginning, and we're going to talk about preventing arthritis, and then I'm going to pose the question that we've asked, been asking people across Canada, is would you if you could? So first of all, why are we talking about prevention? I want to sort of walk you through a window of opportunity, which is a continuum of um, increasing risk and decreasing numbers of people. So if we start at the left-hand side, we've got people who are developing genetic and environmental risk factors. Um, so we know that people, females are more likely to go on and get rheumatoid arthritis. And there's certain things we can expose ourselves to that put us at an additional risk of rheumatoid arthritis. As we go on through this window of opportunity, some of those people start to develop uh, antibodies, which we can see in the blood, and that uh, identifies people who are at an even greater risk of rheumatoid arthritis. And then later on in that continuum, people start to get symptoms, so they start to feel tired, getting the joint pain and stiffness. So this window of opportunity and our ability to try and work out who might go on to get disease has led to quite a lot of excitement in clinical circles. And now there's currently five trials going on which are looking at treatments that we would normally give to people who went on to get the disease to see in this window of opportunity whether they can prevent the disease actually starting in the first place. These trials have been positioned at different places in this window of opportunity. So the first treatment, hydroxychloroquine, or you may know it as Plaquenil, that's been targeted at people who are starting to have these autoantibodies in their blood. Then there's four other trials which have been targeted at people as they start to get symptoms, but they're not quite at the stage where they get diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. Just to walk you through some of those studies, uh, treatments being studied, um, they're all being taken over one year in the trials. Hydroxychloroquine or Plaquenil is an oral tablet, so you take a pill every day. And these aren't immunosuppressive, so they tend to be safer than some of the other drugs that are being studied. Statins are very similar. Um, they're oral tablets taken daily. They're usually given to people to reduce cholesterol, uh, but they may, have, they may have protection against rheumatoid arthritis as well. Then there's methotrexate, which is one of the main drugs that we give to people with rheumatoid arthritis. That can be taken orally or by injection. It's usually given weekly, and it does suppress the immune system. So there's an increase in, um, I guess, safety risk with these types of drugs. And then we get on to biologics. So there's two biologics being studied. These are basically drugs that have been developed in living organisms, so they're a little bit more expensive but they've been revolution and, uh, revolutionary in treating arthritis. So these are thought that it may give the greatest benefit and protection uh, from rheumatoid arthritis. And these are usually injected in, under the skin or infused into veins and on a, a longer treatment period than the other treatments. So that's the background. And we were interested in whether we were actually starting to put the cart before the horse when we started to talk about preventing rheumatoid arthritis. So given that people often don't have symptoms or don't have, haven't developed the disease, we are interested in, are these people going to be willing to take the risk of these treatments to prevent a disease that they may or may not ever get? And similarly, are healthcare professionals, um, people who are going to be expected to care for these people, are they going to be willing to recommend these types of treatment uh, when there's a risk that perhaps we're exposing people to, uh, to risks without any potential benefits? And we've been trying to do that before the train leaves the station. So we're worried that once these trials start to report, 
then the evidence is out there and there's an accumulation and an expectation of um, people that we, we can just force these treatments out and expect people to take preventive treatments against rheumatoid arthritis. So we're trying to work, use that window of opportunity before the trials report to find out what's most important to people in these preventive treatment decisions. And we're looking at healthcare professionals and people at risk. And then, once we've worked that out, we can start to understand whether people will actually take the treatments that are being studied in trials in practice if those clinical trials suggest that they can prevent rheumatoid arthritis. So we've been running studies across Canada. We've used first-degree relatives of people with rheumatoid arthritis. This is to try and get the perspectives of a, a, a kind of at-risk group. So it's not a perfect definition, but we know um, sibling, like first degree me family members like parents, siblings, adult child, children of people with arthritis do have an elevated risk. And most of the people we spoke to were female, which fits in with the risk profile, and we got people from across Canada. We also spoke to healthcare professionals as well, uh, mostly rheumatologists, but also some nurses and some pharmacists. Most of these were working in British Columbia as well, but we have representation from across Canada. And again, most were female. And what we were asking them was, what are the key factors that you want to think about if you were going to make a decision about whether to take or whether to treat someone with preventive treatment? And we spoke to people in focus groups and tried to understand what the five or six main things that they wanted to know about when making this decision would be. And we came up with the risk of side effects, so how safe is something, the size of the risk reduction, which is the benefit, so how much is my risk of rheumatoid arthritis going to be reduced. The tricky one was the other person's opinion. So both groups told us that they wanted to know what the other person in the conversation thought. So if I'm a healthcare professional, I want to know whether the person who might take that drug is comfortable with that option. And if I'm at risk, I want to know whether the healthcare professional who I'm talking to thinks it's a good option for me. So there's a bit of an interplay with this attribute here, or this feature. There's also how treatment's given, so how convenient is it, what am I going to have to do to have the treatment, and then how good are the risk and benefit estimates that we have on the different treatments. So we took those to surveys and tried to understand how people prioritise these different things. And I think the assumption in the trials is that the size of the risk reduction or that benefit is going to be the most important thing. But that's not what we found. So we found that people at risk, or the first degree relatives that we asked, they think safety is the most important thing. So what am I putting myself at risk at by taking a treatment? Healthcare professionals, and this is reassuring, want to know what the person who's going to take that treatment thinks about that option. The size of the risk reduction came in second, so it was important, but it wasn't the, uh, the biggest priority. And then the top three, even though they're in different rank order, were consistent between groups. So first degree relatives wanted to know what the healthcare professional thought, and healthcare professionals wanted to know that the treatment was safe. The other things were important as well and in different orders, but the main message is that we get results that suggest that the priorities for different the groups are not the same. At-risk people are going to prioritise safety, whereas healthcare professionals want to try and recommend something that the person who's going to take it is comfortable with. And the, import, the most important thing is not the benefit or the risk reduction from RA. There's other factors to consider. We then go on to see how this affects decisions potentially. So let's have a look at the at-risk people. So imagine there's a treatment that's taken exactly the same way, but one of the treatments, the treatment on the left-hand side, has a greater risk of something, some side effects happening than the treatment on the right. <clears throat> In this situation, let's just imagine that the healthcare professional's equally happy with either decision. So what does the person choose? Well, we found even if we have a huge risk reduction for the high-risk treatment, let's say it takes the risk of developing arthritis down from 60% to 25%, people wouldn't necessarily take that treatment. They'd actually be willing to take a, a, much, uh, a treatment with a, a much smaller potential benefit to avoid that risk. So they would trade off or give up the potential for some of the risk reduction from rheumatoid arthritis to have a safe treatment. So the message from that was that first-degree relatives would choose a much less effective treatment if it was safer. What about healthcare professionals? So the same setup, we've got the same drug, it's taken orally. 
At this occasion, the risk is going to be the same between those options. But let's imagine in talking to the person who's going to take it, they prefer the treatment on the right-hand side to the one on the left-hand side. So how does that play into decisions? So let's imagine on the left-hand side, the treatment that people aren't looking like they want to take offers a big reduction in risk of rheumatoid arthritis. Well, we think that a um, healthcare professional would be most comfortable uh, take, recommending a treatment that doesn't reduce the risk so much and sacrificing the potential benefit to have a treatment that matches the health, the uh, recipient preference. Finally, what does this mean in terms of what people would take? So we go back to those treatments that are being studied. We think out of 20 uh, first degree relatives, those in the, the pink, we think that four to f about five people would not take any treatment at all. And we think that two out of 20 healthcare professionals wouldn't recommend treatment. Hydroxychloroquine or Plaquenil was the treatment that most people at risk seem to favor. And there's also a, a potential for healthcare professionals to prescribe that too. Few, uh, equally, people at risk would be willing to take methotrexate, whereas this seems to be the treatment that healthcare professionals would be most uh, likely to recommend. And then another safe but potentially uh, less effective treatment, statins, was a, a big favorite of people at risk, not so much for healthcare professionals, but the consistent message we've got from both groups was that the biologic treatments, so the, the kind of most potentially effective but most risky, we don't see that anyone would be willing to either take or recommend those treatments. So the main message that we got, decisions about whether to take any medication, and in particular preventive medication, are complex. Potential benefits of the risk reduction for getting RA is going to be secondary to other considerations. People have different perspectives as well, so we can't expect that people at risk and people who are prescribing drugs have the same perspective. People at risk were most interested in safety, but also valued convenience, and they were most likely to take nothing or one of the safer options like hydroxychloroquine or a statin. Healthcare professionals Reassuringly, we're really interested in what the person who's going to take that drug thinks, but we seem to think that they're likely to recommend methotrexate or possibly hydroxychloroquine. So one of the key messages is that taking time to understand each other's preferences in these decision-making process is going to be really critical. We also got a message for research as well. So there's five current trials looking at preventative treatment, and we think that at least two of those we have little support that people would actually want to take those in practice. There are other options out there that have been studied that may be good options, but we think it's important for people to know that we're studying treatments that may not be taken in practice before the trials report and we start to push out policy. And there's also a big message there about how we can gather preferences before we start to do research, do more patient-oriented design, and understand what people really want before we start testing these treatments. And this method we've used is a way of getting at that before we start to run the trials out. So I'll finish with that and take questions. And I just want to acknowledge the huge team of people that supported me in this research. And I'm not going to read them out because that would take me way beyond my time. So thanks for your attention. And uh, I'll be happy to ask any, answer any questions. So please put up your hand if you have a question. And we'll bring the microphone to you. Hi, um, I was just wondering if uh, you noticed a difference in people's willingness to take medications depending on the severity of their relatives. So like for example, if their mother had mild arthritis, um, were they less likely to want to take the medic preventative medications versus someone who um, had a relative who had very severe arthritis and was more severely d disabled? Yeah, we, that, that's a really good question because that, I believe that is something that would really play into people's decisions. Um, we didn't have that information. Um, and we, we also thought that if, the, if you got an indication from your sort of relative about the severity of their, in, in their disease, that would sort of play into your expectations of if you develop that disease, how bad it's going to be. But we just couldn't collect that information. So we had a separation in this study of uh, who the person was and who the relative was, so we couldn't, we couldn't answer those questions. But yeah, I think if we, if we did that again and we had a bigger sample, we were able to access a bigger sample and we're more confident with 
uh, people's risk status and also the status of their first degree relative as well. That would be something that would be really good to look at. So yeah, great question.